Good morning. The sun is coming up uh, on our first morning in the bee box. Bee box was very comfortable. We had the windows wide open, the breeze blowing through, and uh, everything's great. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Noondorfer with Advanced RV and I'm pleased to show you uh, the Bee Box. This is a new product that we've been working on for about uh, 10 or 11 months and there's a lot to it. We're going to show you all the technology and things that we put into this. About a year ago, we were desperate for chassis. We have a good backlog of orders with wonderful clients. We couldn't get chassis. I'm talking to one of the leaders of Mercedes uh, Marketing and he says, can you use cab chassis? And I said, no, uh, we can't because all of our backlog is for sprinter vans. Uh, we need sprinter vans and we need specific sprinter vans that we ordered specifically for our clients. And he said, well, it's too bad. I can get a lot of cab chassis. So I went home that night, uh, went to bed, thought about it uh, and thought, uh, you know, what are our clients objectives in going to a sprinter van for their motorhome. Is there any way we can make a cab chassis meet those objectives? One of our, our top objectives is comfort. And comfort applies to all different aspects of the motorhome. Firstly, the driving comfort. The center of gravity on this is very low. We have air suspension on it, a big opening from the cab into the back. We heat with the floor, but we also have auxiliary heat. We cool with a split air conditioner with a 48 volt compressor. Compressor and the condenser are underneath. The evaporator's inside and, and it's a uh, quiet ducted air conditioning system. A big bathroom, a huge bed that uses uh, latex foam, very comfortable bed. Large windows for viewing out of the sofa, strategically located, are all part of the comfort. Another of our client objectives is off the grid capabilities. And so we have a large lithium battery pack uh, configured like a single battery with shunt, uh, state of charge information, and a very simple operation, automatic operation with auto start so that if the battery gets low, your pets are in there, it'll start, recharge the battery. Off the grid also, you might notice the lowest ground clearance point here is nine and a half inches. So this is a, a ground clearance that you might find with a Sprinter 4x4. High ground clearance, I've had it off the, off the road. Uh, it handles great off the road. Tanks, 50 gallons of fresh water capacity, a gray and black tank each with 27 and a half gallon capacity. And these tanks can be operated individually and valves so that you have an individual gray and an individual black tank, or you can pull valves and have them equalize and share the capacity. A lot of flexibility for off the grid and on the grid. Four season operation. You don't want to have to worry about freezing up. With the bee box, each tank is embedded in insulation, all six sides of it. And on the bottom side of all the tanks, we run hydronic heat with aluminum heat transfer strips so that whenever the heat is on inside the van, the tanks are heated. When you look at our new control system and you press on tank, it tells you how many gallons are in the tank, what percentage full it is, how many pounds of liquid is in the tank, and it tells you the temperature of the tank. Big tanks, heated tanks, heated interior, very highly insulated. In fact, this unit, getting back to comfort, is so tight with all the windows closed and sealed, CO2 just from breathing will, will increase. So you either have to crack a window or what we've done is put an air exchanger in so that it's constantly circulating fresh air into the van across a heat exchanger. So it adds to efficiency that heat exchanger is around 80% efficient. So when the heated air goes out, it leaves its heat with the heat exchanger and then when the heat comes back in, it picks up the heat so that you're not losing the heat or cooling in the summer. We don't know how good this is gonna be in the winter. We know that with the dual pane windows and the highly insulating box, we have about an R14 uh, R value. So it's very insulated. And with the tank insulation and the tank heat, uh, we're pretty sure that this is an Arctic vehicle. 
Another objective our clients have is to have a vehicle that's nimble. And uh, the nimbleness is, is a function of, of turning ratio. It's a function of approach angles. It's a function of uh, its size. You wouldn't guess it, but one of our objectives that we think that our clients direct us to is to have this the same size as a Sprinter van. So it is the same height as a typical Sprinter van with the air conditioner on top, just under 10 feet. Uh, it is the same width. Actually, the exterior width is about three inches narrower than a Sprinter van with the running boards on it. And the length of this uh, model is the same within a couple inches of a standard 170 Sprinter. Now we can put this on a 144, we can put it on a Transit, we can put it on a, a whole bunch of different vehicles. We have custom side lights, four of them, two of them on each side, and a 360 camera system. So you have a, a 360 view and a selected view. You can look out the back while you're driving. So the 360 camera system adds to the nimbleness and the flexibility. Another objective our clients have is, is they want the option to be able to be stealth. In other words, to be able to park someplace and not be identified as a motorhome. All the antennas are on the inside. The only thing on the roof of this is two vents for the uh, tanks. And uh, because the air conditioner is on the inside, you pull the shades, turn on the lights inside, nobody even knows you're in there. Another objective that clients have is to be able to be serviceable. So everything we do, uh, we, all the systems we put in here, we think broadly about what space it occupies, can we keep it cool in the case of batteries and inverters, but also if it were to have a problem, how easy is it to access? In this back compartment, there's access to the pumps for the hydronic heat, the recycle shower, all the components are behind the refrigerator, so there's access if there were ever a problem. We have easy access to everything from the fuse panel to the macerator to our electrical system, access, maintainability. That's part of, of how we build everything. What we started at, when I went home and you know, kind of talked to myself about what our objectives were, we want this to be the same outline dimensions as a Sprinter van. We didn't want it to be any taller, but we wanted the ceiling to be taller. We didn't want it to be any wider, but we wanted the inside to be wider. So those were the things that Jonathan and I started out with and uh, Mercedes sent us a, a cab chassis and we went to work. Probably four or five different paths we went down, found out it, well, it wasn't going to fit our objectives uh, and then we had to you know, kind of uh, go back to the drawing board again. And then one day Jonathan comes in and he says, hey, I got something that looks pretty good. I don't know how we find stuff, but Jonathan is amazing at searching and finding things. We are calling it a B-Box. It's the same footprint and the same height as a Class B Mercedes motorhome. It's about one and a half inches wider on each side than the widest part on the van, not the mirrors, but the widest body part. It's under nine feet, eight inches high, which is the height of a standard Sprinter with an air conditioner on it. And the length is within about five inches as a standard or an extended Sprinter. But the cool thing is on the inside, uh, we have 79, almost 80 inches, 79 and three quarters inches. I'm about six foot three, six foot two or three. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of headroom. And then the other thing that's really exciting is even though the outside is a class B width, the inside is uh, 78 inches. So uh, definitely you can sleep across, you can even put your ankles down. The other thing this does, if you think about it, the Sprinter comes, starts at 69 inches wide. This is 78 inches plus, 78 and a half at the bottom. But then the Sprinter comes in. The Sprinter is 69 inches across. So whereas you can, you can sleep flat out in the B box, at least I could, the Sprinter is not real comfortable for that. And the height of the Sprinter this doesn't have a subfloor, so there's going to be another half, three quarters of an inch of flooring insulation, sound insulation on the floor. So by the time we put the subfloor down and ceiling, I'm pretty much topped out here, uh, especially over on the edge. It gets a little bit uh, narrower. The Sprinter, and it's a nice feature, 
actually has an aerodynamic uh, shape which brings the sides in. In here, the wall is straight up. You've got all the space at the bottom you have at the top. So there's a significant amount more cube in this than there is in the van. We still love the van. The van has a lot of advantages. We're, uh, almost all of our clients uh, are still building on vans and we're not trying to make a change there. This is just an alternative. This is the floor. This plywood is covered by a fiberglass woven fabric that's uh, impregnated with polyester resin. And in the center is closed cell urethane foam. So this is a strong uh, pultruded fiber reinforced glass pultrusion it's called. So because it's pulled through a process that creates strength in, in multiple directions. It's fairly heavy. So this is glued up and assembled. And then the wall is glued and assembled in uh, a vertical position. So this is all glued together, very strong. And then when we install the structure for seat belts and seats and sofa beds and cabinets, everything we put in there reinforces the uh, strength of this box alone. These extrusions allow us to use a quarter inch steel plate drilled and tapped in tension inside of this pultruded section and we can bolt through and without creating a thermal path and bolting all the way through. That's how we attach the floor to the chassis. That's how we attach anything structural in here. One of the things we've done, we've cut the, the roof out back about uh, 14 or 16 inches and we're going to insulate this fairing that gives us really good fuel mileage. You'll notice when we cut the top of the cab off, there is not as much structure as we'd like to have, even though the box is extremely strong. So what we do is we take this heavy piece of aluminum and we make a, we make a composite or a sandwich out of it. So it, it ties into the frame and goes up and makes an arch. And then there's a piece across the top and another piece like down, down the side. And this is all bolted together uh, between two pieces of uh, 5 8 plywood and it gives a, a, essentially a roll bar. The thing I want to emphasize is the maybe over engineering that we, uh, we applied to this. Uh, when we first started looking at how we're going to mount the insulated box on the chassis, uh, we looked at the Mercedes mounts and we did some calculations on loading and we decided we wanted to distribute the load further between the box and the support. Part of this is that ultimately this is going to be a, a very rugged vehicle that is probably going to be used off-road and we want to make sure that it's robust. So the first thing we did was we created structural extensions of all the mounts. So these black uh, steel pieces here bolt onto the frame and then on top of each of these structural pieces is glued a uh, half inch, might be five eighths, uh, hydrometer elastomeric cushioning section to further distribute the load between the frame and the box. So we have a structural reinforcement to distribute the load and then uh, a, an elastomeric, again, hydrometer. It's very stiff, so it's not gonna create any kind of motion it's just going to isolate. This gets flipped over and attaches to the underside of the chassis with these high strength bolts. And uh, they go into threaded steel. There are 32 bolts. And then the elastomeric is going to be up against the uh, bottom of the floor of this. And one of the key factors is this, is that our floor is right on the Mercedes chassis. There's no subfloor, there's no under, underlying wasted space. So we've maximized the available interior space by putting the floor right on the, on the chassis of the truck. It created a, more challenges for us to run the piping and electricity inside the truck, but we solved all that and we've got the maximized interior space. And it's a little bit more of a free design space than a, than a Sprinter van chassis to, uh, to have adaptability for the customer's needs. There's a lot of safety features that are built into this truck that I designed in that you really can't see. Using the tanks as a crash barrier on the side of the truck. I mean, they're, 
uh, weighted, they're heavy, they, they provide a lot of safety. Uh, the bed, there's a structure that's uh, built into this whole truck, then the bed is actually tied to the frame of the truck. So it's an integral system that's safe. So we went to a lot of extra length to do a lot of behind the scenes things. Mike, you talked about a lot of the stuff you could see, but then even behind the scenes, we've spent time to make sure that things are the way they should be. We've been really trying to nail down the best layout for the interior of this thing. We're working around a lot of restrictions as far as how things can be cut into the van and um, how the things can be assembled. So we're really trying to make sure that we utilize the space as best as possible. You start to imagine like how far the cabinet's going to come in, you know, where is it going to open up? Is the bathroom going to go all the way to the ceiling? Where is that going to be located because it's going to block some of our light? We're starting to discover new ideas because of these design challenges we're having and then working in partnership, of course, with the engineering team for uh, everything that's been established underneath the chassis. So where our water tanks are located, where the batteries are located and making sure that all that jives with our layout. Here's the entrance into the B box. And the first thing you'll notice is a cab in this van has become part of the living space. The way our clients travel, they want a good access between the cab section and the main living area. And they want that to both be handy for if uh, the passenger wants to get up and go to the back and make a sandwich or something. But also at night, they want to be able to turn the seats around and use this area. We checked all different kinds of configurations of how to get from your seat to the box. And the handiest way that we felt was to be able to get up and then have a step fairly far back. So this step is approximately seven inches and it, it's right here behind the seat pedestals. So this, you can walk, I'm six, two or three, and I can actually step from the cab to the box without hitting my head. Also storage up on both sides of the cab upper area. A lot of storage, but mostly a lot of access, a lot of room. Right behind the cab is a convective microwave, refrigerator, it's an isotherm Italian refrigerator, great interior, and then a huge freezer. When you use a van, it's often difficult to find a place for your shoes. We created three shelves for shoes here. Stainless steel countertop, the sink size is huge for a motorhome and the width of the counter is huge. When we were uh, cooking last weekend, Marcia said, I really love this huge countertop. And I'm thinking it's not that long, but she's used to a countertop that's five or six inches narrower. Of course, the lighting is, is gorgeous. It's amazing how well the lighting gives you uh, a feeling of space. These lights can change color, they can be dimmed, but then the width of the aisle is amazing. Marsh and I could each probably gain 30 or 40 pounds and we could still get by each other. The aisle is huge and then the bathroom is huge. It's square all the way up so when you stand in the bathroom with a van you have a, a slope in here and it's difficult to have room to maneuver around and especially showering. This has our normal uh, shower curtain extension. The shower curtain comes all the way out here. A window in the bathroom. Ian did a uh, custom medicine cabinet. This will hold uh, toilet paper. There's uh, an electric outlet up here that you can take uh, cords down and you can power your toothbrushes or whatever you have here. Our controls, you can turn the night light on, the vanity, the main, the, all the lights. Recycle shower. So there's two shower uh, nozzles here. One is if you want to shower using fresh water, you have the mixing valve, which gives you the temperature you want. So again, it's a systems approach. The, you know, the objective was how can we make the best use of our water? And so one way was to recycle the water. And the next way is to use recycled water to flush the toilet. The water that you're showering with is pumped out of the sump through a primary filter, which takes hair and other things out. Uh, it's a stainless steel filter. Then it goes through a particulate filter and then another particulate filter, which has a carbon filter in it that takes out uh, smells and stuff. And then from the carbon filter, now that all the particulate is out of the water, it goes into a UV, uh, they call it a filter, but it's really a sterilizer. It, it kills bacteria and virus. 
We've got controls in place that allow you to choose to flush the toilet with our recycled water. It automatically refills the recycled tank. You can tell the water temperature. We've got sensors that monitor how plugged up the filters become based on pressures. And so you can kind of see all those things that are going on. There's a cleaning mode. So the, let's say you're on an extended trip, you don't want to dump your recycled water. It allows the water that's in the tank to be uh, circulated where you can rerun the water through the filters and then through the UV to clean it up. So it keeps the system clean and, and ready for you to use that same water that maybe you've been using for two or three weeks already. For several months, I would use and experiment with filters and the filter types and I would uh, take showers every night after work. So I mean, it was a really good experiment and it worked well. And uh, I was really surprised that, you know, you can actually use three or four gallons of water for several weeks. And if you uh, clean it up with the filters and polish it up with the UV and kill the bacteria that you could keep the water clean enough to reuse it. The cabinet support is a truss system that's glued to the walls and ceiling. What we're looking at here is structure for the upper cabinets. But it's more than that. It's structure for the box itself. These are glued on all the surfaces here. In the back, there's a grid pattern that uh, captures glue. So these are incredibly uh, strong. The gussets create a, a, an incredible amount of stabilization and strength, as well as uh, supporting the cabinets. Ooh, I'm impressed. Oh, oh man. 185. There's just no way that you can move this or tear it off the wall without destroying the whole thing. And behind these aluminum soffit covers, there is a trace that allows us to run plumbing. There's a cable tray for DC electrical and a cable tray for AC electrical. So we, we can keep the instrument and the DC separate from the AC. Part of this van is the structure that Jonathan created here. There's a steel structure behind here. The bed, the batteries, the seat belts, um, all unified in this incredibly strong steel frame. This steel frame is bolted through to steel in the uh, poltrusions that are in the floor. It's also glued to the wall with uh, high strength glue. This is the, seat, the shoulder harness attachment. This will be another steel frame between here. Anything we do that supports anything in the box, we're looking at it from a dual or a triple function. So we've designed it uh, so that it's robust and safe if anything ever happens. So you have two legitimate uh, shoulder harnesses, one on each side of the couch, and then a, a lap belt in the center. This couch sofa bed goes into a flat bed, which is incredibly comfortable. It has a Sonos sound system. And uh, BMO, who's our sound expert, certified for probably 25 or 30 years, 20 years anyway, we just said, BMO, knock yourself out with this. Put the best sound system in you think you can find. So he put a Sono system in with a sound bar over the TV, a subwoofer, and two speakers that are behind these grills. He put it in here. He listened to it. He said, ah, we've got some echo out of here. We need to insulate put a soft insulation inside of these enclosures. And by the way, these speakers are completely enclosed with speaker cases. So he, he, I didn't hear the echo, but he put it in there and uh, the sound system is just fantastic. We have a touch screen control system that will manage most of the components in the coach. And that's from lighting to pumps to water, just all of the subsystems that are involved on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have help screens built in. So if the button's not intuitive enough, you can hit the help screen and it gives you some background information uh, beyond just the look of the button. Instead of having controls just in one particular spot on the coach, we have the ability to have a main screen as you walk in the door. We can have devices scattered throughout the coach or you can connect with your phone and um, have the same screen that you would from here. This little gadget here is a CO2 monitor. When we breathe in air, we breathe out the CO2. This van is so tight and so well insulated, if you close all the windows and the doors, the CO2 will uh, gradually build up. 
And so we have what's called an air exchanger on the back tied to this CO2 monitor, but this air exchanger has a heat exchanger in it. So if you're in the winter, 20 below zero, you don't want all your heat going out with the air. So it goes through a ceramic heat exchanger, which heats up to the temperature just a little below the heat of the air going out. And then when the air comes back in, it heats that outside air up to nearly the same temperature of what's inside. The uh, air exchanger we're testing right now has uh, three speeds, Bruce? It does. Um, its advantage is that it goes through a single tube. So the way this one, particular one works is to exhaust the air first, and then about a minute later, it turns around and pulls air through the same space. It has that advantage of, of being a single hole through your wall, um, not a bunch of ductwork or anything else that a lot of other units need. This window has uh, two layers of acrylic, about three quarters of an inch thick. So there's an air gap in the center that gives, provides insulation for the window. Marsh and I have been testing this out and we didn't get any rain inside. It has a screen that locks in the up position. And then you can bring down the shade as much as you want. If you want some screen and some shade, you can get more all shade you can, uh, you can uh, adjust it however you want to. This hatch is designed so that it gives you protection from the rain and sun. So it's designed on a slope like this. We put two bikes in here with tires on. It has a little more depth of uh, storage than uh, even the extended van uh, with a sofa bed. There's short power, smart plug, in here, there are pumps and other things accessible for the S-bar, the tank heating and floor heat. The BTU necessary to heat this is, we calculated about 20% as much as a well-insulated sprinter because no matter how well you insulate a sprinter, there's metal that transfers heat out to the metal. It's really difficult to make it thermally efficient. All the windows and doors that Jonathan was able to find have no conductive path for uh, thermal transfer, so they retain the integrity of the box for all seasons. This enabled us to use hydronic heat in the floor to heat the whole box. What we've done is we've used a small furnace, actually. It's, a, it's like a boiler, only it only goes up to 185 degrees. So it heats a glycol fluid. There's a storage of the fluid, about two gallons under the hood, the furnace and the glycol heat exchanger, it's only about this big. We mount that under chassis where it's accessible but out of the way. And then from there, once it's hot in the tank here, it's pumped through a serpentine heat exchanger that heats hot water. And then it goes, in this van, goes through two loops through the floor that actually heat the floor. These black marks on the floor show us where the hydronic heat hoses go. We have one loop forward to back on the bottom of the tanks between the insulation and the tank itself. This is the gray and black tank setup, and uh, these are uh, closed cell insulation that go on the top of the uh, roto molded tanks. There's also insulation on all, all the other sides, and a huge amount of insulation on the sloped bottom of the tank. So in the winter, if you're up above the Arctic Circle, uh, you have the tanks heater set at 46 degrees. On the control system, you can see what the uh, temperature of the fluids in the tank is. And the coolest tank determines when the heat comes on in that section. The solenoid turns on and heat flows. We also, on this one, have convective auxiliary heat through the air conditioner coil. So we're using a very small amount, about less than two tenths of a gallon an hour of diesel fuel to heat the van and to create hot water. Now in this van, there's a second heat exchanger that has glycol going through it because when we recycle the water to the shower, it loses a little bit of heat. It has to go through a reheat. So we have another reheater with a feedback sensor for temperature that heats the water to your comfort when you take that long shower. This has a 48 volt alternator and battery system and that 48 volt system directly runs the air compressor for the air conditioning system. So that air compressor is mounted underneath, way up out of the way. It's 48 volts, so we don't have to run it through an inverter, which you would have to on a 110 volt air conditioner. 
And that takes about 15 to 20 percent efficiency away from the whole system. So uh, last week it was 90 degrees and about 60 percent humidity. We put this outside in the sun. We had the air conditioner running. It was 100 percent duty cycle. We ran it for six hours and had about 50 percent battery uh, state of charge left. In this van we have 48 volt battery system that goes through an inverter to make 110 volt clean sine wave power. Also there's a converter that converts the 48 volt DC back down to 12 volt DC so that it can run the refrigerator most efficiently and of course the LED lights are also 12 volt. We found standard tanks, the largest tanks we could find and possibly fit in into a chassis like this and we took those standard tanks and we adapted them to be on the outside of the frame but yet add to the design of the truck so we crafted our own tank boxes that are insulated and heated. So 50 gallons of fresh water, 54 or 5 gallons of gray and black. Yeah. The gray and black can be separate tanks or with a pull of a valve they can be combined uh, so there's a lot of flexibility. This is the access to the macerator. If you're at a campground this cap comes off and you can put a three inch hose on here and have continuous discharge of the gray and black tank. If you don't need 27 gallons of black capacity but you need more gray capacity you can pull the both valves, the tanks are connected with a three inch connection and the tanks will equalize the capacity. You can then leave them so that they'll continuously uh, equalize or you can equalize when you want to uh, close them off again. We wanted to make it as easy to dump gray and black tanks as possible. So we made it a drawer. Uh, soft closed drawer. Pull out the, the hose, put it in the drain, open the valve and turn on the macerator. It's really an easy way to empty the tanks. And I know there's a lot of fear and trepidation about black tanks and uh, we put a lot of composting toilets, we put a few cassette toilets in. So that's always an option, but this is much easier and we've used a bed liner to coat for ruggedness. We've really taken a lot of extra care to design the underneath of this truck so it's clean and there's a lot of ground clearance and there's not things that hang down and everything's tucked up and away and protected. So, you know, from, from an off-grid standpoint, that was one of the highlights that, that I looked at and spent a lot of time on. One of the objectives that's important to our clients is to be able to confidently go off the road. We can put this on an all-wheel drive Ford Transit, but with the Sprinter chassis, we wanted to have the underside as clean as possible. This is about the lowest point on the chassis, and uh, here you can see it's 10 inches of clearance, 15 inches in the rear, so the rear approach angle is, is pretty dramatic. Uh, even the, the hitch support is 13 and a half inches. Talking about ground clearance, there's some additional innovation that we've done on the cab chassis and we're going to do on all of our vans eventually. And that is, we've gone from a single piston uh, leveling system to a telescoping piston leveling system. This gives us about a three inch, uh, a little less than three inch shorter piston, which gives us about three inches more ground clearance. It also puts the pad closer to the wheels, so the angle of departure is better, higher. The attachment is stronger, and it gives us more elevation for leveling. We have other videos that explain the air suspension. Every one of our clients now chooses to have the Mercedes rear suspension changed out to a computer-controlled uh, dynamic air suspension. So one thing though that we've done that improves the air suspension is we've uh, worked with Fox shock absorber and uh, with Fox we created a custom uh, shock absorber for our air suspensions, both two wheel drive and four wheel drive that provides even a better ride and more stabilization. The mounting for the side lights, there are two top mounted side lights on, e on each side is uh, a design that we put together and 3D printed in our, in our shop here. Uh, they're custom so that they have the lowest profile possible, but hold the lights that provide good lighting on the sides. 
We also have uh, 360 view cameras. So there's a camera in the front, camera on each side, and a camera on the back. You can select views from the uh, driver's seat and it comes up on the Mercedes large screen display. So we teamed up with a company called Aerodyne in Great Britain and they provided shrouds, fiberglass shrouds, for the top to transition and the side to transition with as little airflow interruption as possible. The other thing we did was since the back of the van creates a, a, a vacuum essentially, there are air vortices that come across the, the side and since there's a negative pressure in the back, they tend to fill that in. If we can break those vortices up with these air tabs, we can have more efficiency and less interference when you go buy a big truck and stuff. We put a remote entry on the side of the V-Box so that we can lock and unlock the cab easily. When you open the door, the steps automatically come down, but it can be overridden in the front so the, the steps can stay down. One of our client objectives is to be stealth. One of the most important things about stealth is that it doesn't look like an RV. Now, with the curtains drawn inside, you can't see any light, even at night, coming out. So it looks like it could be a delivery truck. Uh, some clients may want to put uh, mom's homemade pies on there or something else. I think it's as stealth as a van, but everybody's going to have their own view on that. There's no metal in this roof, except the thin strips where we need it for structure. So we have our antennas up under the shroud in the front so that we're not taking up roof area and, and the antennas are very functional here. The electronic systems are built just like our regular vans and you've got a, a very easy to service uh, a bay. You take the lid off, all the stuff is there. Hey BMO, I'm gonna hey. videotape you a little bit here. You're, so you're dressing these wires and you told me those are gonna, those are mostly IO wires over mm -hmm. there that go on the IO board. Yeah, but I yeah. see you're making a loop there. Uh, why are you bothering with a loop? I mean, that looks so neat. So why why you got that loop there, Bima? Really, we have two levels of the silver leaf, so I have to be able to get up underneath. I don't know if you can see. Oh yeah, there, so there's a I, more I/O down there. Yeah. So to service it, you have to be able to move this board around a little bit. So servicing this stuff is all is part of the. Part of the layout, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Just keeping it clean. Access and cooling. You know, we gotta oh, yeah. think about all the cooling on the inverter, which is the blue thing there, and then the batteries, which are gonna go behind it. We had a client call a few weeks ago, and I, I mentioned before, our clients drive our, our innovation. And he said, I want you to build a box that I can take off of the chassis. And that way I've only depreciated the chassis part of this thing. and I think it's a great idea. It's not set up to do it easily, but when the first client comes and says, hey, I'm ready to do this, we're ready to design for a quick removal. Yeah. We didn't advertise it because we don't advertise things until they're done and tested. But as clients came to visit us and we talked about their travel objectives and how they wanted to travel, once in a while, we would have somebody that didn't really fit a van chassis application and so I would ask them if they would confidentially like to see a project that we're working on. This is a van that we're building for an architect in New Orleans and he has a couple children. So we put a pop-up camper top and then an excess ladder for his kids to get up into the pop top. He's even putting a washer dryer in it. As far as changing any, anything that Advance does, every single motorhome that we build, we learn from. We learn from every single client and we learn possibilities and our craftspeople are challenged and, and energized by our clients and what they want. So from, from the standpoint of what drives us and how the B-Box might distract us from this, nothing can because that's our foundation. That's what this company is founded on and that is being as absolutely close to the market as you can and you can't be any closer than listening to every client understanding their needs, working with them to most elegantly and with the best design meet those needs. And so every van we build, every client we work with drives us forward.